those thin walls like an umbrella or like our very flesh. So I was told that some of you expected an explanation of how UU Manchester became a level one sanctuary church. But you know, the truth of the matter is that's governance and business and not worship. So I will give you the very short version. We step aside for this moment into meeting for business. When the issue began to really rise around immigration recently, most recently, it has been alive for a long time in this country. Some of the members of the congregation I serve, some of whom showed up today, this is serendipity, we were not planning all this, I was not planning all of this, because they were concerned, they wanted to know what we might do. And I thought that this coming year, which is now the year we're in, that we would talk about this, that perhaps the church would make a commitment to the sanctuary movement, that maybe, maybe we might even think about being a sanctuary, though physically we were not anywhere near able to do that. No one could imagine it. At our annual meeting in May, the Social Justice Committee came forward with just a week's notice, as I recall, to the board that they were going to do this. They brought a resolution saying, we commit ourselves to being a part of the sanctuary movement. And so I came with a little trepidation, not sure what was going to happen as we took on a serious commitment without having carefully massaged and prepared you know, this. And the congregation voted unanimously to become part of the sanctuary movement. They committed themselves not knowing what it would mean. So by the time September rolled around, there were people who were organized. There were things going on. We were actively part of what was going on in Manchester. People were going to the vigils at the federal building. And a little later in the year, the resolution was brought to a special meeting that we become a level one sanctuary, that we prepare to take someone in. And the questions were real. Where will someone stay? Our building is not designed for this. We don't have a shower. There's certainly not a bedroom. All the rooms are in use. We had to decenter ourselves to do the work. One of our carefully built bathrooms, something we were so proud of because there was accessibility, had to be rebuilt so that there was a shower. And for a time, <clears throat> There were people who thought that would mean taking out the accessibility, and there was conflict. The bathroom did get re redesigned. There is still accessibility, and there is a shower, thanks to the funding of both members of the church and people like you. And I had to decenter myself. I have office space at home. I moved out of my office giving the church a space where they could say, yes, someone can be here, if they voted to be a sanctuary, which they did. Governance, business, social justice, holy work. The story of sanctuary at Manchester so far. We do not yet have anyone who has taken us up on the offer, though we have come close. <clears throat> we return to worship. So today we gather for worship in this lovely space, a sanctuary, a place literally set aside for worship. But the word has also meant a refuge, a place of safety somewhere beyond the hostile, dangerous, threatening force of law for at least 1,500 years, longer in fact, at least since the time of the Roman Emperor Constantine, sanctuary. 
Someone who was hunted by enemies, hunted by the law, guilty of almost any crime, could flee to sanctuary churches and be safe. In some cases, all they needed to do was reach the doors of the church and reach up and grab hold of the great iron ring on the door and claim sanctuary. In other places, they simply needed to enter the church, which was unlocked at all times. Refuge. Safety. People who would care for you, protect you, look out for your safety and well-being, even if you had committed some heinous crime. There is no right to sanctuary in America, not in the law, and yet we still have this deep-seated cultural expectation that places of worship are special that they have this nearly magical aura about them. That is real. People have sought and been given refuge, sanctuary, in churches in America for at least the last 40 years. Neither federal nor state officials have ever violated it. Something about the image of police dragging someone out of a church puts them off. Even if the law doesn't establish it, we all recoil from that image. It would be shocking, it would be horrifying to see someone on TV dragged away from the altar and down the steps. So we do not have the force of law, we have the force of moral authority. But where is this notion of sanctuary rooted? We have come to think of it as something that we offer to immigrants, to people with problems with their legal status as immigrants here. But that's just a quirk of history and circumstance. Sanctuary was provided for a wide range of offenses. It is rooted in one of the most ancient, deep-seated human values, the notion of hospitality, looking out for each other, being a refuge, a shelter, a sanctuary for people in need. <clears throat> Around the globe we find legal codes, religious codes, stories and myths that all underscore the profound obligation that we have, that all people have, to give shelter and nourishment to strangers, to travelers, to guests, and that we have an obligation to protect them. When a traveler arrives at your door, feed him for three days before you ask why he's here. And it's not just in that part of the world. The codes around hospitality reached up into Northern Europe. There are people, perhaps here, who have some connection to the Campbell clan and there are people who still will turn away from you in Scotland if you're a Campbell because the Campbells violated hospitality. They asked for shelter and they turned on the people who had given them shelter. Violating the codes of hospitality was a heinous, unforgivable sin and it echoes through the generations. They tell those stories. They tell them in song. They do not forget people who violate hospitality. One of the best known and most misused parts of the Hebrew scriptures is the story of Lot and the city of Sodom. For its iniquity, Sodom and its sister cities were obliterated by God, we are told. And we are told by our society that the sin of Sodom is sexual, which is odd because the Bible is actually quite explicit. In Ezekiel 1649, it is explained exactly why Sodom was destroyed. The verse reads, 
Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They did not help the poor and needy. In ancient codes, that kind of inhospitality, that hardness of heart was worthy of destruction. Not some imagined sexual sin. Sodom was destroyed for failing to care for the poor and needy, for failing to be hospitable. So hospitality, this ancient moral obligation, one that we feel comes to us. It is a deeply felt impulse, and Americans have been beneficiaries of it in very recent times. On 9-11, when this country was attacked, one of the immediate protective measures that was taken was to redirect all air traffic immediately. Wherever you are, wherever you're going, land at the nearest airport now. Commercial airlines put down all over the country. You may remember, you may have been one of the people who had to figure out how to get home from somewhere like Omaha or Des Moines or Santa Barbara. International flights were redirected, barred from entering U.S. airspace. The easternmost international airport in North America is in Gander, Newfoundland. It dates back to a time when aircraft could just barely make that crossing. So a refueling site there in Newfoundland was very useful. But typically, Gander being rather small, only a few flights land there each day. On 9-11, 53 aircraft were instructed to land there, including 27 American international commercial flights. Gander was and is a small place. The population was around 10,000 people. There were almost 7,000 people stuck in their airport. The population nearly doubled. <clears throat> and the passengers weren't just stranded there. They were stuck without their baggage because in the moment of 9-11, no one was going to give those people their baggage, not without scanning it carefully. Who knew what horror might be there? So there were thousands of people without a place to go and without any of their luggage. Gander has at most 500 hotel rooms. People were forced to stay on those planes overnight and then only allowed to deplane one at a time. The people of Gander had taken that time and reorganized their town, their city, to take on this unimaginable responsibility for unexpected guests. They didn't need to ask why they were there. People were housed in every imaginable place. People's homes were opened. Schools were shut down and people stayed in them. Meeting halls were turned into dormitories and so on. The stores, the stores were opened wide for people to get the things they needed, toiletries, clothing, and they were not charged for those things. The students of those shut down high schools were tasked with looking out for the well-being of their city's guests, families, were kept together. Women were offered women-only facilities to stay in if they preferred. <laughs> People needing medical and dental care were given it without charge. For days, the people of Gander cared for these strangers that had been cast onto their shores by fate. They fed them. They entertained them. They took them out on hikes and tours. Bakeries stayed open to provide bread for all these people, and people were taken to the restaurants and given great meals. This is hospitality. This is sanctuary. 
Their refugee problem was as big as the population of the area, but instead of creating a fenced off camp, they opened their hearts and their homes. They offered refuge. They made Gander into a sanctuary city. They committed an amazing act of hospitality. Songs should be sung about this for generations. In the final analysis, this is what being a sanctuary really is. It is opening your heart, your home, your space, your wallet, your kitchen, your family, and making room for other people. People in need, people who drift up on your doorstep and need you. They are in need of shelter, of food, of clothing, medical care, and protection. Sanctuary means accepting and embracing disruption and inconvenience and expense for the good of other people. The church I serve has embraced that idea. We haven't had anyone yet take us up on the offer, but we have invested a vast amount of volunteer time and a bunch of money, ours and other people's, Thank you for your assistance. We could not have done this alone, which is the lesson every sanctuary church has learned. We cannot do this work alone. It takes all of us. When someone comes to us, there will be a sanctuary, but the demands will then become real. Building a bathroom was not the great challenge. It's the people who will be necessary to look out for our guests 24-7, 365 days a year. We cannot do that alone. We've made arrangements, some of them, and some of them will only happen, people will only step up when it becomes real, when those planes are parked on our tarmac. We have to have an American citizen there 24 hours a day, every day of the year. We have to be ready to tell the people of Sodom if they show up pounding on the gates that they are not welcome, they cannot come in, that we are protecting our guest, lest the city be destroyed. The law, the law is not on our side. We have nothing but tradition and morality on our side. It has, in the past, always been enough. In the end, being part of the sanctuary movement means deciding, choosing to be a citizen of Gander. We open our hearts and our lives and wallets to the needs of other people who are truly in need and facing terrible injustices. And we take their side. We commit ourselves to be with them, to support them, to do what we can to help them seek justice and for them to trust in us to provide them with as much safety as we can, knowing that nothing is certain in this world. This is being hospitable. This is sanctuary. It is entering into covenant with people who are not just like us, who probably are not like-minded and do not share all of our values. But they need us. We need not think alike to love alike. We commit ourselves to the side of love and to being sanctuaries, each one of us, everywhere we go. We commit to being hospitable. We insist on the worth and dignity of every person. Sanctuary, sanctuary is the umbrella that we raise together. It is living out our faith. May it be so.